My name is Michael Summers. I'm the uh, president of the Irish chapter of the Ireland US Council. Uh, and on my own behalf, on behalf of the Council, I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. Our programme today features a speaker who occupies an important and distinguished role in our society, and one that impacts on us all, uh, because we all rely on our, I think, to protect our, our freedoms against uh, an overarching executive. So we'll, we're delighted to welcome the Chief Justice Susan Denham here today, and she'll speak to us later on. Uh, but I'd like to welcome her and thank her indeed for giving us her time uh, to be here and to uh, give us her insight. So could I say, first of all, that we value very much our excellent relationship with the United States Embassy here in Dublin, and it's always a great honour to welcome the American Ambassador to Ireland, Kevin O'Malley, who's here with the Embassy Chargé d'Affaires, our good friend Stuart Dwyer. So today, Council Member Yvonne Muldoon, who's the newly appointed Director of Sales at Lingus, is here. And we're delighted to, to, to welcome Yvonne again. She's been here wearing various different hats over the years. Can I welcome Yvonne to the podium to say a few words? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of Aer Lingus, it's an absolute pleasure to be back on the council podium and to connect with so many industry friends and partners. Um, I'd like to make special reference to Roddy. He really has been a phenomenal business partner, mentor, and good friend for the last 20 years. So, Roddy, thank you for all you do. Thank you for all you do for the council and for the aviation industry in general. And I know there's plenty of airlines here today. I think they'll all agree of how supportive you've been to the aviation industry in general. So sincere thanks for that. Um, and I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to some of our Lingus guests here on table 15. Thank you for joining us. You're most welcome. So Erlingus is delighted to continue its long association with the Ireland Jewish Council. It goes back to the first event that was held in New York in the fall of 1962. Um, the strong business community and the ties between Ireland and the United States continue to strengthen and prosper. Connectivity, as we know, is fundamental to foreign direct investment. And us and Erlingus are very proud to play our part in providing the strong route network between our two countries. Erlingus has announced um, a few months ago a massive long haul expansion in 2016. This is now the single largest expansion of the transatlantic network since we commenced flying back in 1958. So the capacity, a few numbers, up 16%, 16 to 17%, and we'll have over 2 million seats. We'll commence new flying to Newark, um, on the 1st of September, followed by Hartford, Connecticut, uh, with a daily service on the 28th of September. And in a few weeks' time, on the 4th of May, we will launch Los Angeles four times a week. So that brings uh, three additional routes, which will bring us up to 12 services to North America and Canada. So this growth initiative will create more jobs. It's 200 new jobs for pilots, for cabin crew, for ground service staff. And the growth really underpins the successful strategy of expanding our Dublin base into a European transatlantic gateway. And I know some of our, our partners are here today from Dublin Airport. So as the convenience, sometimes we take it for granted of customs and US border protection. To have that clearance here in Dublin is absolutely paramount. It's my great pleasure now to introduce a fellow council member and sponsor, which is Derek Collins from Bank of Ireland, to come to the podium to say a few words. So thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and it's my first time speaking to you as a, a newly elected council member. Before I get to that, what I want to say, it has been a pleasure for Bank of Ireland. We've had a long association with the Ireland US Council. In Bank of Ireland, I lead the team that engages with US companies looking to set up operations in Ireland. And as you are aware, IDA delivered record investment in jobs in 2015, and in the first quarter of 2016, this trend has continued. And I'm delighted to see the CEO of IDA, Martin Shannon, here, and his executive director, Mary Buckley. And I think we should just acknowledge uh, in a round of applause the work they do. <laughs> Next week, I'm traveling to Boston as part of Ireland Gateway to Europe, where we are hosting a number of high-impact 
investment summits to showcase Ireland as Europe's premier investment location. Travelling with us is George Hook of News Talk, who will be covering the event and the Sunday Business Post. Yvonne, we're all going with Aer Lingus. <laughs> so, my team in Bank of Ireland very much values its role as part of Team Ireland to go out and win new investment in our country. It has to be won. And as I engage with US corporates, we do have a number of challenges ahead, including the need for Ireland to achieve stable government, Brexit, tax inversions, EU data protection, US presidential elections. However, I remain confident that Ireland will continue to be a destination of choice for new US investment. The Honourable Mrs. Justice Susan Denham is Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Ireland. She is Ireland's 11th Chief Justice and is the first woman to hold the position and is also the longest serving member of the court. Would you join me please in extending the warmest of welcomes to Justice Susan Denham. Ambassador O'Malley, uh, President Summers, uh, members of the Ireland US Council, members of the Bar of Ireland and the Law Society, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. The Ireland US Council has, since it was founded, uh, been an important organization in fostering business between Ireland and the US. The uh, Council is to be greatly commended for the work it does in hosting events here and in the United States in its operating its scholarships and its student internship program, in organizing seminars and promoting the commercial links between our two states. The strong links between Ireland and the US may be illustrated by looking through the prism of the law, both past and present. The legal system and the legal ties between Ireland and the US are rooted in concepts of independence and equality. And even let us go back to the 18th century, a time of revolution. The US Declaration of Independence was adopted on the 4th of July, 1776. It was published on this side of the Atlantic in Belfast later that year. And that, those concepts there of a republic, independence, equality, uh, echoed backwards and forwards across the ocean. In 1971, the Society of United Irishmen was founded by Wolf Tone. Uh, the father of Irish republicanism, in Belfast, and they sought to break the link with England and to win independence for Ireland. In 1798, Irish people rose in arms unsuccessfully, uh, again in 1803, when, of course, Robert Emmett was one of our iconic leaders. These United Irishmen were critical, a critical spark for the independence of Ireland, and they left uh, a legacy behind them which still inspires. But from those times, enduring legal links with the United States commenced. For many United Irishmen uh, were lawyers, and those who survived the rebellion were, the, were either went voluntarily or were exiled to the Americas. Uh, for example, while Robert Emmett didn't survive the rebellion, his brother Thomas Addis Emmett did. And the life of Thomas Addis Emmett um, in the US illustrates uh, that of many of the United Irishmen of that time. For the United Irishmen not having succeeded in getting independence and rights in Ireland, uh, they worked for those in the United States. Thomas Addis Emmett was called to the bar in Ireland in 1790. His first case was to defend a United Irishman, and then he developed a practice which was essentially advising them and looking after them when they were prisoners or in difficulty. However, he didn't remain a lawyer because as he continued uh, in his work and in Ireland, he became convinced that we were never going to get independence here or a real parliament um, unless by force. And he thought we wouldn't be prosperous until our links uh, were severed with England, and it's very interesting that he even took that 
view of our prosperity because often the people at that time were looking at political freedom and not also the prosperity of the state. And of course, it was 200 years later when we began to be prosperous. He was arrested uh, with other rebels uh, of a United Irishman in 1798. He was imprisoned until 1802. And after his brother, the rising failed, uh, he emigrated to, to New York in 1804. There, he became a member of the bar in New York uh, in 1805. And between 1806 and 1811, he made 45 appearances before the Court of Errors, which was the highest court in New York at that time. And also he's renowned for the fact that he appeared before the Supreme Court many, many times. And this is very unusual because at that time, travel, of course, wasn't easy. And most of the lawyers who appeared in the Supreme Court in Washington came from Virginia or Maryland. But he made many, many excursions from New York and many, was in many very important cases dealing with equality and rights in the Supreme Court. He became Attorney General <coughs> in New York uh, from 1812 to 1813. And in on, on the 14th of November, 1827, while working in, a, in the circuit court in New York, he collapsed and he died. And they say that uh, on the day of his funeral, the whole of New York came to a standstill for several hours. Uh, Thomas Addis Emmett and other United Irishmen exiled to New York spent their lives growing and developing in New York ideals and in the United States, ideals that they were not able to develop in Ireland. And they, they developed freedom and equality and they were instrumental in many cases when I am talking to lawyers, I go through the cases, uh, but many cases where really critical uh, fundamental constitutional concepts were introduced and developed at that time. And they helped to seed in the American Constitution concepts which, which ultimately later we ourselves then took back and developed here. Because of course Ireland at that time wasn't independent and was not able to develop uh, these concepts. Central to the movement uh, from which an independent Ireland was born were many figures who supported the independent independence of Ireland in the, in the United States. And in this, our centenary year of 1916, it's appropriate to remember those who played a key role in the rising from the other side of the Atlantic, uh, where they hatched plans and prepared for our rebellion. And of course, it's important to remember that in the proclamation that Porrick Pierce read outside the GPO, at the beginning of the rising, uh, there is the phrase where it is stated that the rising is supported by her exiled children in America. <coughs> so there were very important people in America that were also supporting the, this uh, Sikh freedom in 1916. Uh, uh, people like John Devoy, who although born in Ireland and imprisoned for treason, uh, he was then exiled to America. And he did extremely important work in developing Clan Na Gael and in helping members from, the, the, from Ireland who were developing the Rising. And in fact, Porrick Pierce referred to Devoy as the greatest Athenians. And we had many lawyers and judges of Irish extraction um, who were involved uh, right through the centuries, and including in 1916. And one of those was Judge Daniel Cohelan, an American lawyer of, uh, of Irish ancestry. He is very close associate of Devoy, and he um, assisted the Irish Americans who went across the sea in the early part of the 20th century, um, and he assisted in developing uh, Clan Na Gael and the various newspapers which the Irish in America developed. Uh, and so here we have very close links developing and continuing in the legal world between Ireland and America. And support from the states for the Easter Rising was really incredibly important. Five of the seven signatories to our proclamation had spent time in the United States in the earlier years. Uh, but of course, um, our ties are much broader than just the legal and the judicial ties. Um, the ties between Ireland and the states bind us together because so many of us have families on either side of the Atlantic. 
Indeed, according to the US Census Bureau, 11% of the United States uh, population has Irish ancestry. And in our latest statistics here, 11,000 um, Americans live in Ireland. And this very high emigration which we've had for the last two centuries means that many people of Irish heritage have been involved in developing the United States. Of course, we <coughs> built bridges, we built roads, we built railways, but we were also involved in the law as lawyers and as judges. And uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States, there was William Patterson, who was born in County Antrim in 1745. There was Joseph McKenna, um, who um, was born in 1843. His family had originally come from Ireland, and he was both a member of the Congress, he was a member of, he was the Attorney General, and he was a judge on the Supreme Court. Pierce Butler was born of parents from County Wicklow, and he was an Associate Judge of the Supreme Court. And William J. Brennan, one of the great uh, judges of the Supreme Court, um, came from em immigrants from County Roscommon. And he was a great friend of our Supreme Court, and I well remember the evening that he came to Dublin and we made him an honorary bencher uh, of our King's Inns. Uh, an amazing man. And of course, Anthony Kennedy on the Supreme Court at the moment um, has uh, Irish connections. But another very important link uh, enduring link between Ireland and the US is that both of us, having become <coughs> independent, decided to keep the common law. And this is an area where, in fact, Thomas Addis Emmet uh, was very active, uh, and other members of the United Irishmen, because as um, freedom was developing in the United States, uh, there was an active radical role who said we shouldn't keep the common law, uh, we should really break completely from United Kingdom, England, from Britain at that time, the empire, um, and let's have a new system of law. And um, Thomas Adesemus and others uh, fought to keep the common law, and this was a very, very important victory, because the common law is a marvelous method of dealing with disputes. It's slowly evolving, it's reactive, and it's one of the reasons why the United Kingdom and America are very good with business because of the legal system. So this was a great victory um, and an important victory in the United States that they did keep the common law, though of course they developed it uh, in accordance with the developing United States. And this decision had also to be reached in Ireland in the 1920s when we got our freedom. Uh, we had to decide, well, what are we going to do about our legal system? And there was those who said, we must follow the Doyle courts, you know, the revolutionary courts, let's follow them. There was those who said that we should apply our Brehan law. And Brehan law is the most marvelous legal system, a thousand years before, the most sophisticated system of law. And the idea was, well, let's re re resurrect that. But in fact, we decided to keep the common law and develop it ourselves. So those were two very important decisions by our two nations, and they've had a very significant effect on our ability to do business. And of course, both of us uh, have written constitutions. And this, again, gives a very strong foundation of rights uh, to both our countries. And we have one, many, but one particularly important um, part of our constitution as a direct consequence of that of the United States. Um, in Ireland, the Supreme Court may declare a law enacted by the Oireachtas Parliament to be unconstitutional. And that's expressly written into our constitution. Now, in fact, when they were looking at the world to see where we should what constitutions we should write. The American Constitution was considered seriously by our drafters, and the Constitution of the United States doesn't expressly say the Supreme Court can do this, but the Supreme Court read it into the Constitution as being inherently there. So this is a very common um, power that our Constitution, Supreme Court has and the Supreme Court of uh, the United States has, and the Supreme Court of the United States led in this. Um, we were 
um, the first common law country after that to have this right, and now this is a common thing in a modern de democratic uh, state around the world that a Supreme Court would have this type of right. Central uh, to the success of a trading nation is a legal system committed to the rule of law with independent uh, and efficient courts. Uh, such courts are absolutely essential to economic well-being of the state. Legal certainty and speedy resolutions of disputes are critical to the economic growth and development of a state. And continued positive reform in the Irish courts um, allows us to cater for the demands that are thrust upon us. Uh, you'll know of some of them. We've established a commercial court, which is working very well. We've been introducing modern case management. Um, and we've had many successful discussions with colleagues from across the Atlantic on how we all cope with our dockets. Um, we now have modern case management in the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, and in many divisions of the High Court. And of course, the Court of Appeal is one of our most important developments in recent times, uh, because prior to that, all appeals came to the Supreme Court. There was a huge log, log jam and delays. But since the referendum, 2014, we now have a Court of Appeal, and this will mean that appeals will be heard within a reasonable time. I'm delighted to be here with CEOs and members of many important uh, companies in Ireland, because many significant companies are located in Ireland um, in important industries such as software, pharmaceuticals, medtech, ICT and finance. And of course, in the ICT area, top global, global companies are here, including Intel, HP, IBM, Microsoft, DMC, Apple, and Amazon. And then if we take in internet and social media, we have Google and Facebook and Twitter. And of course, this has led to a section of Dublin being called the Silicon Docks. Uh, when we look at the number of people employed by the US companies in Ireland, it's at an all-time high. In 2011, the IDA uh, reported that at that time, 600 United States companies employed 100,000 people here. Uh, that increased to 108 in 2013, and the American Chamber of Commerce suggests that it's now 140,000. However, our relationship is a flourishing two-way relationship, and Irish companies in the US employ over 80,000 people. There has been an enduring legal a dialogue between the US and Ireland since our nations were founded. Our foundation is similar. We have a written constitution. We use the common law. We speak English. Ireland in the European Union. Ireland is a gateway to the European Union. Our court system is constantly engaging in positive reform. Our courts, our courts are run by independent judges. They are managed by an independent corporation and an independent bar is available to all who seek advice, who wish to litigate or to mediate. This enduring dialogue has borne fruit. It has enriched the legal systems of both states and encouraged business links between Ireland and the US to flourish. This has been assisted by the Ireland US Council, who are greatly to be commended for their continuing work. The Ireland US Council was founded in at a time when JFK was coming to Ireland, and during his visit here, he said, he spoke of the many and enduring links which have bound the Irish and the Americans since the earliest days, culminating in two nations divided by distance, having been united by history. And so today's meeting is an illustration of the strong, enduring links which continue between our two states. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.